Good afternoon, good evening to all our listeners and welcome to Hard Talk Between Sisters online radio station, Your Story. Hard Talk Between Sisters is a platform where women come together to share their stories and experiences and insights. Through our conversations, we seek to empower and uplift one another, to inspire our listeners, to touch the hearts of many, and to make a positive impact on our community. At Heart Talk Between Sisters, we are sharing stories, inspiring growth, sharing stories, and empowering lives. My name is Alana Wheeler, and I am the host for the program this afternoon. Our program this afternoon will run from for one hour, and I just want to say a special welcome to our listeners from the African continent, I know it's night time or evening time in Africa. And today, it is my great honor and privilege to welcome, as our sister having conversation, Dr. Sarah Abba Afari. She's Reverend Dr. Chief Superintendent of Police. She wears so many hats and has so many titles that today we just had to zero in on just one or two of the many hats that she wears. And I'm just going to tell us a bit about Dr. Sarah Abba Afari. She's from Ghana, from the Botoko in the Volta region of Ghana, West Africa. She's the first female police officer in Ghana and in Africa to, to obtain a doctorate degree or a PhD. She is a chief superintendent of police and has 33 years of experience in policing. She's currently the divisional crime officer for the Medina Police Division in the greater Accra region. Uh, she's a wife, a mother, a painter, a philosopher, an art educator, an art therapist, a counseling psychologist, and she's a minister of God. She has a PhD in, edu in art education, and we are going to hear some more about that PhD in art education. It's very, very interesting. And so please permit me this afternoon to introduce to our listening audience, Dr. Sarah Abba Afar Afari. Welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Lady Elena. Okay, it Thank is so good to me. have you. It is so good to have you. I know you're a very busy person. And so we're just going to get down to the meat of everything. I know we do have some law enforcement officers who are listening in, male and female, from different continents and different parts of the world. And I'd just like to say a special welcome to our law enforcement officers who fight very hard to protect and to serve the citizens in their various countries. So, Dr. Afari, um, Chief Superintendent, I'll call you. Tell us more. Who is who is Sarah Abba Afari? Let's put aside all the titles and all the accolades. Who is Sarah Abba Afari? Thank you very much for having me. And then before I answer, I would like to appreciate your cherished viewers and also send my felicitation to my colleagues, my family, and my friends who are listening. Thank you also, uh, Dr. Ambassador Green, for the opportunity to have me on your platform. I am Sarah Bafferi. I am a product of discipline. Um, family discipline and a professional discipline. I come from a large family and whatever I am today, I owe it to the pleasant memory of my late parents who brought me up in the family system and I imputed into me values. I believe in community development because I believe in a family system. 
So I devote my time to study and then share my knowledge in building the community I work in, helping the vulnerable in the community, and conducting research to finding new ways of doing the old things so as to bring improvement to the community. So, Sarah Abaferi is a community-based woman who has faith in herself, also have faith in women that given the equal opportunity, women will be able to move Ghanaian, we say foot to foot, to match foot to foot with men. All things be equal. I, as a police officer with 33 years experience in criminal investigation, my background in all areas of my discipline, that is home discipline, professional discipline, academic discipline, has gone away a long way to empower me to be able to solve problems. So by God's grace, Dr. Abba Ferry is a problem solver. Yes. Okay. And as a well, philosopher. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Um, you know, you touch on some things where you spoke about coming from a large family, um, being very disciplined, having values, believing in community development. And um, I'm really interested in that coming from a large family, you know, because sometimes in so many of our um, communities, um, children who grow up in large families, um, sometimes you may have some that may fall off the radar, if you want to say, um, because, you know, there are so many children, so many mouths to feed, and it's a challenge for the parents to raise so many children and for so many siblings, um, really being able to see about them financially. So I wanted to, you know, if you could share with us some more about what was it like? What was what was the experience like growing up in a large family? Thank you. As a child, I was raised among nine siblings and then a standard family relatives live with us so my parents were not very rich people but they were very responsible parents that took care of us and then they made us to understand that sharing is life so if other people should see us that maybe we were deprived, we don't see ourselves as such because uh, we've learned to share whatever we have. We learn to depend on one another. So we don't have this issue of stress or depression or whatever because our large membership serve as a therapy to us. Wow. And then your, your weakness is your sibling's strength. Yeah. So yeah. we were trained to express ourselves. So we're not trained as teammates. We're all trained to express ourselves. So mm. we're able to express ourselves in whatever situation we find ourselves. And our parents created a platform that they, are, they were approachable. They were not mm -hmm. monsters, parents beating their children, intimidating mm -hmm. them up. My, my parents were listening once. They have time to listen to you. Listen. Our father will encourage you to speak. And then if you don't speak right, then he will teach you next and speak this way because you are a responsible child. So mm -hmm. we grew up in that environment, aspiring to be what 
rich children, rich children, they have different set of life. We see them as very living a good life. They have all that they have, but we share. So we also aspire to be like, when I grow up, I want to be this, I want to be this, I want to be this, so that I'll be able to take care of myself. So our parents taught us to be, to be self-reliant. We should have confidence. They help us to raise our self-esteem. So these are some her uh, heritage they left for us especially me, because my father told me that we should go to school, we should stay ourselves in school and study, because the common denominator between a rich child and a poor one is school, that is a classroom, everybody is equal. Mm -hmm. So with this background, we study and we became who we are today because of the family system. Yes. Wow, that is a thank you for sharing that. And is is in in your time growing up, um, was that how most families raise their children in your community? Yes. Okay, so One, that was the norm. Yes. Okay. That's, that's, that's so good, you know, and I think that is such a, a good example that many families can look at today and follow, you know, um, and you had both parents in your life, both father and mother were in your lives um, growing up. Yes, I right. lived with my father, the late James Michael Kwame Afari, and my Beloved mother, Akosia Osubudi Afari. We live in the same house with this large family. And one interesting part is that our large family plays with other children from large family. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 there is bonding in, in the community. Yes. yes. Community yes. members, children group, see, saw themselves as siblings. <laughs> with different mothers yes. yeah so, so have you so now when, when you look back at that time and you look at now and families now in the community do you see a difference in how children are raised now in your community back then parents have time especially nature their children because and they don't stay at home all the time. They go out and back up the way. But mothers, our mother is always there to ensure that you do the right thing, to train you in mm -hmm. everything a woman should know. Yes. Uh, or, yes. To cook, to clean, to, to, yes. to be self-conscious. Yes. 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 But now... Because of economic situation, most mothers mm -hmm. are working women. Right. Yes, they work in, mm -hmm. most women work in the government setup. So mm -hmm. most of the time they leave their children with nannies and then they go to school. So other people train their children for them. Mm -hmm. Unlike us, our parents train us and they we observe this value. They inculcated their values into us, yes. which we are also continuing. But now, people leave their children with caretakers who might not even take care of them. So the time mm -hmm. they learn wrong values. Yes. Because yeah. when the mother comes home, the child is asleep. So wow. the bonding yeah. might not be there. That is why we are having children who are who may be LGBT at uh, behaviors of uh, violence or what because mm -hmm. there is no bonding, and that mm -hmm. that deficit is there. Mm -hmm. yes, That's very interesting. You know, that is it's a very interesting what you said about because there is no bonding between the parent and the child. 
Uh, we're seeing these um, va value systems, discipline, all these things are being affected negatively. Yes. To yes. some extent, I'll say, yes, yeah, this mm -hmm. is responsible for that. But if there, should, there could be a mechanism that uh, the government or the authority or that be will give women opportunity to close early and come home to take care of their children, I think we could reverse this trend the whole, in the whole wide world. We could reverse this trend because parents and children need to bond. Yes, I, I love I love bond. what you said. I love what you've said um, about parents and children need to bond. And I know with all the work you've been doing, it's, I mean, it's 33 years you've spent in policing and you would have done a lot of work in the community as a police officer. So you, you would have been privy to seeing how communities have changed over time. All right. Um, so I thank you so much for sharing that about your family and your background. So we're going to switch to talking about your policing career. Why, 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 why did you choose policing as a career? Hello, Elena. Uh, yes. Oh, I'm, let me repeat. I know the internet for our listeners, the internet is giving us a little bit of trouble. So I'm going to repeat. Um, why did you choose um, to be a police officer as your career? Uh, policing is a whole passion for me when I was a child. Our house then shared boundary with the police in Hohoi in the Volta region. So I used to see the police lady in their uniform. I am so much attracted to their smartness. I see them as the highest people in the world in terms of government or the establishment. So I've been admiring them. And then at times when I'm sent to run errands, I go and hide and I'll be observing these police officers. So <laughs> I told my father that <laughs> when I grow old, I'll become a police officer. And the interesting part is that when my father reads the daily and it becomes redundant, mm -hmm. I go through it. And the wanted bit where police permit um, place a uh, wanted list for criminals i take it and cut it with scissors and i have an envelope where i keep them that i'm i told my parents that i'm helping the police to look for these people <laughs> yes how old were you then and then yes from eight nine oh that's really young this passion was high that's really young Yes. <laughs> and then I grew up with this. And then I could remember the fantasy in school. I used to play police. <laughs> yes. During break time, we are playing. I always want to leave. I'm a police. When you do this, I'll arrest you. I'll arrest you. <laughs> so <laughs> I was very, very inquisitive. And then yeah. <laughs> with time, I became the police officer. I desired to be, and because of the passion mm -hmm. and then the encouragement received from my parents, mm -hmm. I think I have, I have become one of the best police crime officers in my country. Wow. Because of, yes, mm. because of my background, and then the passion. I am just living my dream. Yes. As a police uh, officer. Yeah. You know, yes. it's really a blessing to hear a police officer say that, that you're living your dream, you know, and that you've you've had this dream since eight years of age, you're saying, you know. That's uh and, and that you have no regret from, from listening to you. Um, you have no regret in fulfilling that dream of becoming a police officer. And, you know, congratulations to you. And we, we, as the listeners, we say thank you for your service to Ghana and to the entire world at large. Because, um, you know, from your CV, 
you've gotten involved in so many um, different global global events. And, you know, we'll, we'll get into that in a little while. Um, Dr. Green, how are we going for time? Are we good with time? That silence means a yes, we are good for time. So, uh, Dr. Abba Fari, um, looking at, you know, your background, you did a lot of studying. And I know you mentioned that um, your parents encouraged you to go to school, study and everything. And you studied so many different things, psychology, um, art, painting, guidance, counseling, art, education. And then you reached as far as doing a PhD in um, art education. And you want to tell us, you know, what, what was so appealing about studying, doing all this studying? Thank you again. When I became a police recruit and I, I finished my training, I was posted to my station. Because of passion, I excelled. So I was, I, less than a year, I was attached to the CID to do investigation. Mm -hmm. So I began to learn. I began to learn. And based upon my childhood passion to observe criminals, I have that skill to observe people very well. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've developed that skill to observe yeah. people, features about people, unique ones. Yeah. So that anytime I see you once, I can remember, recollect you a, so many years after seeing you. Mm -hmm. So as a investigator, I realized that certain cases uh, have deficiency. For instance, identification, people were not able to assist, uh, in identif identify people by describing their features. So mm -hmm. I had opportunity to go to school. So I wanted to do painting, that is fine art. And mm -hmm. I tell you, painting is a problem solving exercise. Mm -hmm. Yes, so my four years first degree in painting exposed me to so many things that either two I did not know. So my interest in solving problems within my criminal investigation has heightened. Okay, and so I, I started Dr. Abba, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, um we can take a pause. We just take a pause okay. for a few minutes, just for a little break, and then we'll come back. So hold that thought. We'll be right back. Thank you. Heart Talk Between Sisters radio broadcast. Tune in to a heartwarming and enlightening radio experience like no other. Join us on a journey of love, laughter, and lifelong connections as we explore the unique bond between sisters. Our broadcast is a celebration of sisterhood. Offering a safe space for candid conversations, shared memories, and inspiring stories that touch the soul. Whether you're a sister yourself or simply appreciate the beauty of this extraordinary relationship, this broadcast is for you. Discover the secrets of sisterly love, support, and understanding as we delve into personal experiences and heart-to-heart -heart conversations that will make you smile, cry, and reflect. So, grab your favorite cup of tea, get cozy, and let our heart talk between sisters, broadcast warm your heart and lift your spirits. Join us every week for an emotional journey filled with wisdom, connection, and the enduring power of sisterly bonds. Don't miss out on this extraordinary experience. To listen to our station WCAN Radio for this, and other informative programs, all day long, visit www.wcanradio.us. To be a special guest in any of our segments or to support us financially, through sponsorship, call 1-868-397-5961 or 1-678-856-3709.
Okay, we are on air with Dr. Abba Afari from Ghana, a senior police officer who lives and works in Ghana in Western Africa. And Dr. Abba Afari, you were telling us about all the different um, academic courses that you were doing and that you got interested in painting because you used to observe a lot um, in the community and with, I guess, potential suspects and persons in the community, persons of interest. So you developed a liking for painting. So let's hear some more about your journey in painting, exploring painting. Thank you. As a painter, I've achieved a lot of success in my criminal investigation endeavor. Painting became a foundation for the studio art clinic in the art therapy. When I finished school as a painter, I was able to track down suspected criminal. My observation skill was sharpened. So in cases where rape victim could just um, describe certain feature, features of their perpetrators, I'm able to sketch this, and which helps me to do a critical search for such a criminal. And then with time, I realized that having a base in painting, which helps me also to solve other problems, because as a painter, I, I, I don't have what is called depression or whatever, I'm able to order myself appropriately because painting is, is uh, means uh, to make a composition is to bring to order what is what disorganized. So mm -hmm. this has also helped me in my life. So that I'm able to organize what used to be disorganized through my painting ability. With time, I realized that I need more knowledge so I could assist people because some people show disposition of trauma or stress or depression mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. the course of my work. So mm -hmm. I decided to veer into counseling so I went into art education at MPhil level and researched into counseling that is done at the prisons, the Ghanaian prison, because I've also observed that most prisoners that were convicted, I mean, were coming back. So recidivism was in the increase. So that helped me to know the deficiency in the counseling services at the prisons, which I submitted my recommendation, which was which were worked on. And I'm so proud that I I, I was part of that. Wow, well, well <laughs> the, um, your, your breadth of experience and even um your research, your research and your knowledge expanded way beyond that of um policing and investigating. Uh, where you actually went into looking at what was happening with the prisoners, you know, so yeah. you were really looking at how can how can it how can we prevent um the crime, prevent persons from committing crimes over and over and over again. So that's a very wide wide span of study and research that was covered throughout your life, throughout your thirty three years, and I can congratulate you and commend you for all of that, you know, for taking that personal interest in your work and um, really expanding your knowledge and your thinking in the area. So um, so tell us, um, tell us about what, how did you balance um, pursuing all these courses, a family life and your police work? How were you able to balance all of those things and balance your time? Uh, whatever an individual focus or set up his mind to do 
with planning, everybody will achieve what he planned for. Mm -hmm. As a a police officer, my work is demanding, Mm -hmm. very, very demanding. And then I ensure that when I get to work, I work dedicatedly. Mm -hmm. What I should do, I do. Mm -hmm. What is expected of me as a team leader, I do. And I inspire my team members to Mm -hmm. buy into my dream of solving community problem. That is doing thorough investigation, no shoddy work, do thorough Mm -hmm. investigation, Mm -hmm. and as a Christian, most of my team members are also Christians. So Mm -hmm. I inspire Mm -hmm. them, the Bible says, whatever we lay our hands on to do, we should do it with all our heart and with Mm -hmm. all our mind. So with Mm -hmm. this motivation, my team is a good one. All right, thank God. Thank God, and that alone is a blessing in itself when you have a very good team and a team that is yes. motivated to do the work. So so you were able to do all these things because you had a good work team and you were able to inspire them, motivate them, and you basically just had to supervise, oversee the work that they were doing. And um, yeah. you know, that, that's always a good thing. It's always a good thing <laughs> when we could just give the instructions and we know that the instructions will be followed um, and we just have to make sure, you know, and check and everything. So, again, I mean, that's such a great accomplishment. And, and Lady Alana, I yeah. don't just give instruction. <laughs> I lead. Ah. We do yeah. it together. Yes. So I build their capacity in doing it together with them. So mm. those who get it also build the capacity of those who are not a week. So I build, they build, and on, on, we succeed. And I don't succeed. We all succeed. So I motivate them and assign roles to them. Mm-hmm. And when they do it right, I appreciate them. I, mm-hmm. moti- I, I congratulate them. I praise them. I even give gifts. Yes, yeah, mm-hmm. so every member of my team is happy doing something. They are not doing it to please me, but they are doing it because it is right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So as a mother, as a mother, when I leave work and I come home, I am a full mother. Mm -hmm. I cook, I clean, whatever a mother does, I do. I go to the grocery shop, shop with my children, cook, clean, strip the, do whatever a mother does. I do. So when when my children are asleep, when the house is down dead, we sleep. Then I wake up to study. Mm. Mm-hmm. So I sacrifice most of my sleeping time to study. Because I have planned, I have to do list, and then I used to review it when I am not able to do it. So I am always working according to my to do list. What to do mm-hmm. today? If I can't do it, then I have to review it. So as I study, maybe I cook at the same time. Mm. So that by the morning, I can serve breakfast before mm-hmm. going to work and, and taking my children to school, driving them to school, and then off I go to work. Mm-hmm. So it's about planning. Yes. Dedication. It's not an easy thing. Sacrifice. My father used to say, what you can't complete, don't start it. So mm-hmm. with this at the back of my mind, I, I need to do it because I've started it. Mm-hmm. Little by little, I will complete. So it is about planning. So there is no limitation for women. If only we can plan and put our priorities right, 
and then mm -hmm. set the agenda rolling for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that what we want to achieve, little by little by little, one day at a time, we'll be able to do it and be successful. And when we are successful, we become happy. That is yeah. it. Well, you know, you are plenty woman, eh? Plenty, plenty, plenty woman. That's what I could say. I mean, I love what you said about sacrificing sleep while your children are sleeping. You are up doing the studying and you're doing the cooking and you're already preparing for the next day. And also to emphasize, you know, you were organized, you had a to-do list, you planned your time. And there was also a passion and an interest in what you were studying. You know, so that made the difference because, you know, sometimes... Sometimes we choose and we decide to go and do a course or do a degree. And it's something that we're really not interested in. You know, it's like huh, half-heartedly sort of thing. So we don't really put our best into it and put our best foot forward. And so, um, you know, from what we're hearing, from what you're saying is that you were interested in everything that you studied, the art therapy, counseling, psychology, all those things. You had a personal interest in it because of what you saw happening at work and on the job. And you took it upon yourself to inform and educate yourself so that um, you'd be more effective on the job. And I mean, that is really highly commendable. Again, I take my hats off to you. I am honored to have met you virtually. And um, you are plenty, plenty woman. So we're going to move on to another part of the conversation. The time goes so quickly, you know. And um, before Dr. Green comes in and says, we're going to have an ad. Um, let's just start talking a bit about um, you as a female police officer. What was what has the experience been like for you? What sort of challenges did you face as a woman working in the police service? Okay. It's not an easy thing to be a police lady. As a constable, mm -hmm. I, I even nearly left the training, but I remembered something. My father said, what you can endorse that. Mm -hmm. So I stuck, I got myself stuck there and I came out. So in the course of work, because of gender stereotypes, Mm. people have the notion that there are certain things women can do and some women also accepted that mm. Mm -hmm. they also accepted that I refuse I refuse uh, I what were some of those what were some of those gender stereotypes for instance there are certain when we were young certain investigation they say this one men should do Men mm. should do like, this like type what of investigation. Like, like a, it's like a daring investigation. Cases that need what? Uh, you need to take a lot of race. And I said, no, I can also do it. Let me do it. If I make mistake, redirect me. Okay. A lot so, of race? Is that like what? Murders? Homicides? Yes. Cases, yeah. so this case mm -hmm. is difficult, and then because it will take your time, it will, mm -hmm. you are a woman, you are this, you can't do this, so they just set a limit for us. Some of my colleagues accepted it, but I refused. Mm -hmm. So I started going to the main domain. The cases that they do, I also do. And then mm -hmm. with time, I became better than them. <laughs> because uh, you know what I did in such cases I built my capacity by taking those who have succeeded, those men who have succeeded in such investigating such cases and I studied it I go to the archives I take all dockers on hmm. such very challenging cases and I studied it and applied it and I applied the steps, the, the, the strategies used in investigating such cases. With time, I became an expert. For instance, a human trafficking case. Mm -hmm. Human trafficking case involved a lot of risk in the past. 
Mm-hmm. But I took it up on myself. I studied it. I studied it. What is human trafficking? Because mm-hmm. people, people took it as it's just a normal, somebody staying with somebody's exploitation. It's just normal. It's a no. So I have to read the books concerning human trafficking. Mm-hmm. Well, and then I became very much conscious. I remember when I went to the UN mission in mm-hmm. Sudan. Mm-hmm. It was terrifying. So all the positions, for instance, the CPC coordinator, men, 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 men. So I told myself, Abba, target this position. Mm-hmm. So I started targeting it. And I started reading what the CPC commanders do because they were all men, the record, all men. Where I mm-hmm. worked, they were all men, the record, there were no women. So I studied. So when the vacancy came, I applied. Mm-hmm. And the interview, I had it. Mm-hmm. And then one interesting <laughs> thing was that as a, a coordinator, I'm the team leader for the mm-hmm. police session in that mm-hmm. CPC. Our team members went to the field and then they had a mechanical uh, force, so they need support. And there are no roads because uh, there's a rural area. So mm-hmm. I mobilized our people, let's go. Mm-hmm. And then I check in as a driver. And then the men, three men sat in the car. They are Europeans, uh, these Jordanians, they are very good at driving. Then I said, no, you can't drive. I said, why can't I drive? <laughs> why can't I drive? They said, no, you give us the the, pen, the key. And I said, no, 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 my friend, sit down, let's go. I am equally qualified driver as you. Okay, so Chief Hello. Superintendent, uh, we're going to stick a pin here and pause for some ads and a break. And we'll be right back in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Introducing the official launch of Heart Talk between Sisters Radio Station. Join us in celebrating the power and strength of women everywhere as we kick off our journey with the heartwarming conversations, empowering stories, and uplifting music on Heart Talk between Sisters Radio Station. In honor of International Women's Day, from March 8th through March 12th, 2024, we invite you to tune in and be inspired by the voices of sisters around the globe. From heartfelt discussions to motivational tunes, we're here to amplify the voices of women, celebrate their achievements, and foster sisterhood like never before. Don't miss out on this exciting celebration of womanhood and sisterhood. Tune in to Heart Talk Between Sisters radio station and join the movement to uplift, empower, and inspire. Together, let's make a difference one conversation at a time. Happy International Women's Day! In conjunction with Heart Talk between Sisters International Women's Day Anniversary 2024. Okay, so that we had some interesting interviews during that um, International Women's Day period. Um, so we are down to the last about 20 minutes or so. I think we may be given some extra time. Um, so Chief Superintendent, you were talking to us about your mission, um, the United Nations mission to South Sudan. You became the coordinator for that mission as I am assuming the first female because it was mainly men who were coordinators. And you actually did receive several awards from the United Nations for some of these um, various missions. You went on mission to Darfur, to Bosnia, um, to South Sudan. Um, the U.S. Embassy in Ghana also granted you an award. And yeah, you went West Darfur and other parts of Darfur in Sudan. And I mean, those are really dangerous as you said, high risk areas. And you mentioned that the men, the police men did not want the women going into investigations or crime areas that were risky. They felt that those were not areas for women to get into, but you chose to break the glass. I mean, I wouldn't even say break the glass ceiling. Um, You chose to literally shatter. (laughs) You shattered the concrete ceiling and you were able to, go in into territory and to terrain 
that was predominantly occupied by men. So let's hear some more about your experience in the United Nations missions. You mentioned about a driver and a driver from Jordan and stuff. Yeah. So I continue from where we left over. And then when they sat in the car, they were dead silent. So I asked that they should put on, they should wear their seatbelt. And I started driving in a convoy. I was leading the convoy and I, with the police section, I was leading the convoy, following a military convoy, a lead. So as I was driving and I'm doing the right manipulation of the gears and the rest and then uh, driving professionally, after 30 minutes, I saw them, I heard them conversing. They, were, they started talking to each other. They started chatting. Mm -hmm. I looked through the mirror and said, wow, they are comfortable that I can drive now. So we drove three hours to <laughs> that destination. And then one of them said, coordinator, you are a good driver. And I said, yes, but you really want me to drive. <laughs> From you there, see? yes, the ladies in the police ladies started driving mm. because they could mm. also drive. Mm -hmm. So as a, a police officer in the mission, I've uh, inspired others to do exploit because they have the capacity to do so. Coming back to South Sudan, I was the team leader for gender and vulnerable people's team. And then I realized that our sensitization or gender violence was not getting through. So I decided to use my research background to conduct research. Why were we not getting it? It's a camp of 40,000 people. Every day there was a domestic violence. So I researched and then my founding was that when women give birth or are pregnant, their men don't have sex with them. And then after six years, when the children are grown, and then the women want to meet their husband, the men went into marrying other young women. So there's always fights. And then they also have a traditional a concept that when you are pregnant, and then there is uh, sexual uh, intercourse, the, the semen will destroy the breast milk and then the fetus. So with this as key, we organized a workshop on sex and invited the key leaders, mm -hmm. traditional leaders. And <laughs> after the workshop, some of the men came, we did not know this. As I will have called you for another wife. And then after the workshop, three months, no domestic violence. Wow. Quiet. Wow. Very quiet. They were leading their normal life. Yes. And with my art therapy background, those who have suicidal ideation because of the harsh condition, I was able to perform art therapy on them. And then mm. they were, okay, they, they became normal and led normal life. Mm. To extend this um, sensitization effort to the whole country, as an mm. artist and a painter, I mobilized and liaised with the, the University of Juba the Artist Association of Juba, and I conducted a workshop, let them know how they could use their skills as painters and artists to reverse the conflict in their country. And after that, we painted, and then we mounted a, a five days paint uh, exhibition, art exhibition, on gender-based violence, and we have 4,000 plus audience. And in fact, 
the period of um, the exhibition, there was no conflict among the uh, tribal uh, communities. Everybody was just enjoying their the, the, the exhibition. They were just flowing with that energy. And then I, I was so enthused because of my background as a painter, as I said previously, that painting is a problem solving exercise. So my background in all aspects in my learning has affected my policy. So I police cons considering other issues that ordinary police will not. Because as a counselor in psychology, I know about behavior so that people who have uh, disordered behavior, I'm able to assist them through art therapy or through counseling. But I prefer the art therapy because it is fast. It is, it, it is so fast. Yes. Yes. So, Superintendent, I wanna, I wanna still get some more into the art therapy. Now, what I, what we're hearing is how very proactive you've been as a police officer, and how assertive you've been as a female working in a male-dominated environment, and even in tasks, male-dominated tasks, you were able to assert yourself and show that you can do the same things that they are doing as men. So with the art therapy, can you tell us some more about how, how does art therapy help to um, reduce gender-based violence and all the other things that you mentioned? Art therapy has its foundation in painting because we have different forms of Art therapy it can be music, but I chose, I'm interested in painting and drawing. So art therapy helps the victim to shred. You see, painting is a statement and art therapy is non-communicative therapy. So through topics, for instance, a traumatized victim who is not talking, and then giving pigments, that's a drawing pigment, colors, and then materials for that person to maybe just do a warm up of doodling, or, and then through that expression, the person, the victim, the sufferer is able to express him or herself. And then by so doing, some victims even get released from just the warm up session. Here, we give, I give topics like uh, after the warm up, will you please draw what makes you afraid? So, it's just a statement. So as a composition, the sufferer or the client is going to express him or herself through drawing. It's not about uh, aesthetics, but it's about a window of letting that client express his emotional or her emotional um, pain. So after the drawing, these drawings are very important to the client and then the usage of color. So we ask, you know, what does this mean to you? What is the meaning of this? And then they give meaning to it. Maybe it's my husband. This, 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 this uh, stick or wood uh, represents my husband. So in a time during the therapeutic process, some of the victims begin to scream, to make beautiful what? Noises. Yes, which is a sign of what? Healing. And then after that, they just sigh, a sign of relief, and maybe some, they just go to sleep, sleep on the desk. So art therapy is curative, mm -hmm. and then it's medicine without what? Actual yeah. medicine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So so then basically it is a form of the person releasing 
releasing the emotions that are locked up and buckled up inside. Yes. So yes. as an expert, I'm able to read the meaning to so it gives me direction as to the next step to take. Mm -hmm. Maybe some victims after three or five sessions, they are okay. They are normal. They, they regain themselves. So I tell myself that art therapy is a powerful tool that helps ailing, painful, painful victims to regain themselves through the power of art. So victims of gender abuse through art therapy are able to express themselves and as they do, they shred the trauma like onion. You cut it, you still have it. And then little by little, they, they, are, they overcome because we take them through other techniques, through art therapy, like flooding and uh, systematic sensitization, through art therapy for them to overcome their fears. What makes them afraid? They are able to touch it and then laugh. Yeah, that is the power of art. So through art therapy, um, I was able to even help police officers, my team members who got traumatized due to one or two reasons, I was able to help them. And even criminals who through investigation relapse, um, I was able to use art therapy to bring them back give them first aid through actual to bring them back to the investigation table to, for us to have our success. And as a counseling psychologist, I'm also able to understand behavior, human behavior. So those people, even colleagues or criminals I handled who are, have disordered behavior or are showing disposition of, I was able to help them. But that's one, it's not very fast to me, like the actor. So I blend all this knowledge to assist people. So you see how powerful all this knowledge become as one tool. So that is why I say I am community oriented uh, police officer. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. We, we do hear that in, in all that you're sharing. And um, I mean, I think it's just amazing what you're doing to really, I mean, to really help the police, to help the criminals, to help the victims, uh, to help your team and to help the community, as you rightfully said. Um, so, you know, uh, going into the art therapy, I mean, um, did you find, did you find cases where, for example, a victim, um, is identified by the police and they do not want to give any information to the police because they're so traumatized and you've used art therapy. And then after that, that victim says, okay, yes, I'm going to give a statement. Now I'm going to give the police the information that you want now. And they were able to get a statement and persons were charged after that. Did you find many cases like that using the art therapy? Yes. One interesting one. You see, some criminals, uh, some people have certain phobias. Some people fear, fear police. So, yeah, they don't they trust police. police yeah. yeah. When mm -hmm. they come to police station, then they begin to uh, get traumatized. They come to, to, to stress out. Mm -hmm. And they cannot even talk. They show this position of trauma. Mm -hmm. So, as an art therapist, I just maybe put red, red pen and a blue pen, there's a take one place. Uh, uh, could you do a doodling for me? And then the person does that. And then in one case, a young woman who, a very beautiful young woman who got married to an armed robber and a later one, a, a, a hardened criminal, a later one got to know from, at the police station that the the, the, the husband was a wanted a criminal and then she became traumatized and then it, it, my, my superiors were terrified because she was behaving abnormally so I said please could I handle her 
So I brought her to my office. And then she, she, I gave her a four sheet paper. And I also gave her a red ink and then the blue one. And then she took the red one. And then I said, today, uh, you kill your husband here. You, she was saying, I'll kill this one, I'll kill this one. I said, okay, you kill this one here. Then she started doodling, doodling with energy, like energy. And then she was sweating, sweating. And then the paper got on, and then I have to push another one. After doing that, discharging that intense energy, she just slept off in my office. She just slept off very, very deep. She slept wow. for so many hours. So hmm. when she woke up, she said, I'm hungry. And then she was behaving normally. So I released her to the parents. And then I rescheduled another session in my office. And then when she came to the next session, and then I did the writing therapy. Just write whatever you hate about that husband of yours. Then she wrote, she wrote many, many, many things. After that, she just relaxed. So what was aching her, she was able to express it through the writing. She was making a statement for me to analyze. And then art therapy helped me to evaluate the progress Mm. of this client the mm. subsequent years so after the test session and she told me i want to do a medical test to see if i was pregnant i said okay mm. but i said she said i'm afraid mm. i said don't worry let's go to the lab so i gave my name she was there she brought the sample and then they tested and it was negative. We came to the office and then we opened it. And then she was negative. Then she was so glad that I'm, I'm over now. I'm free. That is the power of art therapy. Yes. So, that so, so did that particular case lead to any arrests or any charges? Yes. It but did. The, the sus yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because some people even get intimidated because of fear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, therapy, that's really, they, they, that is really powerful. That's yeah. that's really powerful, Chief Superintendent, with um with that particular case. And I'm sure you have many, many more cases that um you can talk about and that you'd want to talk about. Um, Doctor Green has given us some extra time, so we can talk. In fact, he says we can have as much time as we need for the program this afternoon. So I'm happy. Um, once you have the time, Chief Superintendent, uh, we really would like um, to hear for you to share with our listeners about these experiences that you've had with art therapy and the successes that you've had using art therapy and writing. And incidentally, last week, uh, we had on the program, Karen Asgarali from Trinidad and Tobago, and she's a survivor of gun violence. And she used writing um, as therapy to, to help her heal, you know. And her theme is from hurt, from hurt to hope, but healing through writing. So it's interesting hearing you also as a police officer saying how powerful writing and drawing is to help someone to express themselves and to help them in the whole in the healing process. And, um, you know, getting over and dealing with their trauma. It's really interesting to hear that. And I'm so thankful that um, you shared all those things. So tell us some more. You mentioned earlier challenges as a female police officer with the men, with investigations, with driving. Um, what were some of the other challenges you had as a female officer? Because, I mean, you've been promoted. You started off as a constable. And now you're at the rank of chief superintendent, which is a, a position which is just under the commission of police position. So as a female, how did you get from constable to chief superintendent as a female officer? Thank you. As I said earlier, discipline is everything. 
So, home discipline. If you don't have home discipline, it will be difficult for you to maintain yourself in your professional discipline. Because life is all about discipline. As a constable, I studied. As for me, I like reading. I used to read the newspapers. I used to read. So some of the men have been going to the university. I also went. But my going to the university was premised on a promise I made to my father. And I fulfilled it. And then I continued to study. And then I rubbed shoulder with the men. Not to say to spy them. No. I respect their, their culture position. I respect their family position. But I ensure to just move with the trend. What they know, I also know, and I try to even know more. So if somebody knows something more than you and you begin to request for assistance from that person, that means you've accepted that person as having more knowledge than you. So little by little. I went to one station, there were men, 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 and as the, the crime officer, those old hands in the station they want to prove, they, they want to show me that they are men. I remind them. I just kept my cool and I was very nice to them. I talked to them, my subordinate, with respect. And then with time, I had meetings with them when they were not following. And I realized I have a big job to do in this place. And as an educator, I begin mm -hmm. to build the capacity of the junior ranks, the constable, the lance corporal, the corporals in the office. Mm -hmm. I begin to give time to building their capacity in cases with time they picked up. And you know what happened? They were able mm -hmm. to teach the old ones so this we don't do it like this. It's this mm -hmm. way. Let's do it this way. Then mm -hmm. all the office people begin to those who were not accepting me earlier. They thought I would take draconian action. I don't take mm -hmm. draconian action because I realize that I have a duty to build the capacity of the person who is uh -huh. rejecting me, and they, they mm -hmm. now came on board. So intermittently, we have meetings. This is what we should do. What do you think? We brainstorm. We brainstorm. And then mm -hmm. bit by bit, we, 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 we collect all the suggestions. And then because it is participatory, everybody owns the agenda we mm -hmm. tend to do. It's mm -hmm. not like I impose it upon them. So mm -hmm. it is for them. They brought it up. I just, I just fine tune it, and then mm -hmm. we did it. So these are some of the challenges we used mm -hmm. to have. And then, uh, as a a woman, I used to build capacity of my ladies. I happened mm -hmm. to also be the police ladies association president in my division. Mm -hmm. build their capacity that whatever men can do you can equally do if only you give your time, yourself time to study just read something and develop the habit of reading because if you don't read you don't know mm -hmm. if you don't read your working books you don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the women are not taking responsibilities and they are doing it with passion. So it is sinking. It is spreading. So my community is gaining a lot of what? Stability because the police ladies are also able to go to the community and sensitize school children, sensitize the people in church, faith-based organization, sensitize them. So we are working, though it is challenging, Initially, some of the even superior men, they, 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 because you are a woman, 
But with time, I've gained my respect from all of them. I've gained my respect from all of them because when it's time to work, let's work. Let's work. When we were, when it is lunchtime, let's play. Let's laugh. Let's discuss whatever we need to discuss among us. But when it is working time, let's stop mm -hmm. this thing and then work professionally right. because, because there are all we have audience, that is our clients, the complainants and the suspects. Yes, it's, it's, it's been challenging. And then as a woman, we, I, I don't, when we go for workshop or promotional courses or command courses, yes, we need to prove that you also know, which is not only the men who should lead, you should, we, we, as a woman, we also, in our discussion platform, we also proving that we are capable to lead and also give leadership to people we lead. Yeah. And it is working. Yes, that that that's um I, I like that. I like that building the capacity and um investing in the men and not being draconian towards them, you know, um in spite of how they might have been towards you, because I am sure that um <laughs> I am sure, you know, without your even saying it, that you would have had some some interesting attitudes to deal with from some of the men, um, you know, having having a woman over them. Uh, what would you say to female police officers? We have officers listening from other parts of the world, not just in Ghana, but other countries and outside of Africa. What would you say to, uh, to young police officers or police officers who are constables at junior ranks and they want to get promoted, they want to reach in higher ranks. What would you say to them that they should do? And what would you say to them that they should not do? Thank you again. Policing is evolving. And before then, I want to salute the police commissioner of Trinidad, Commissioner Ella Herwood. Christopher, I salute you and I appreciate all your achievements and all the good things you are doing. I respect your leadership and I'm so proud of you. Okay. Well, thank you. I don't know if she's listening or if anyone from the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is listening, but um, I hope they will take that message back to Commissioner Ula Christopher from you. Yes. My advice to police officers, especially to, I'll start with the police ladies. We are women in a men dominated uh, profession. We shouldn't accept any limitation placed upon us, any stereotype placed upon us by tradition, of the policing culture or by our own culture and tradition. We need to know what is expected of us to do. We need to be disciplined because the constable today will become the commissioner tomorrow. So as a constable, you need to learn what a constable should do. You need to learn the responsibility and duties of a constable. So it moves through the rank. So that when you get to a higher position, you know all this thing. So in supervising, you'll be able to supervise effectively and also build capacity of those who you lead. But if you fail to learn what you are to, supposed to learn as a constable and or as a corporal or as a sergeant or as an inspector. And when you become an inspector, you become deficient and you will not enjoy your work. I want you to enjoy your work the way I'm enjoying mine so that you learn. Give time to yourself to learn. Policy is evolving. We need new knowledge every time to perform our duties effectively. And we also learn to be very friendly. We should be user-friendly 
police officer so that the public will have confidence to, to interact with us. Public, any member of the public will call, how are you? I miss you. How is your work? Yes, that means you are penetrating your community. And if the opportunity be for you to go to school, sacrifice, go to school. Go to school to improve upon your knowledge so that you can also be promoted or whatever, you build your capacity, whatever promotional exam, steer yourself to study, to take opportunity when it comes. Don't let it go. And I also want to tell the men that women police are equally capable if you give them the opportunity. If you assign them the same role and give them build their capacity and retool them to work, to be able to work effectively, because women have innate ability to do more than the men, because we, we, we work with that innate ability to solve problems, because women are problem solvers. So if the men do not create platform for women to be to be retrain, train and retrain that their capacity being built, they might not be able to take up responsibility. And this will be demotivating to the younger ones because students are also, I mean, watching police women and men and maybe inspired to become like them. Yes, let's work hard and let's know that we're working for God and country. We should work and take passion and enjoy what we do. And as Christians or whatever faith you have, there is reward for good work. Thank you very much. My goodness. Well, Chief Superintendent, I mean, you've given us a, a, a 10 horse meal, I would say, and a five star a, a hotel. You know, there's so much, and I have just been busy writing, writing, writing everything you've been saying as much as I could, because this is also a learning for me um, as a woman, a female professional. Um, I'm not a police officer, but I work in the field of national security. Um, but I think it's applicable for a woman working in any field, particularly in fields that are male dominated. So uh, I would just like to say thank you so very much for your time. I know you are a very, very busy, busy person, as you said, but you're planned, you've planned your time. And I know it's, it's nighttime now in Ghana. Uh, it's what, about 7 or 8 p.m. in Ghana, I think, or 9, is it 9 p.m. in Ghana? And it's a Friday, and we know that this is time for your family and so from Trinidad and Tobago and from the hard talk between sisters I would and Dr. Green, I would just like to say thank you very much um, again to congratulate you and to commend you on the fantastic work that you are doing in Ghana and in particular in the greater Accra region of Ghana in your community and also to thank you for the work that you've been doing in Lowani as the African um, the chairperson, I think, um, PR chairperson for Africa, Loani Africa, to say thank you so much. I don't know how you wear so many hats, but you did say that women are, we as women, we can multitask. We're gifted with that. We are problem solvers and we are working for God first and then country. So on that note, um, is there any final word that you would like to say to our listeners before we close off? Thank you very much for this great platform. I want to say that I am the Africa Human Rights uh, Chairperson for Luani. Yes. yes. Okay. I want to thank my lovely husband mm -hmm. for his care, giving me time to explore myself and then to be who I am today. Mm -hmm. I also thank Dr. Green mm -hmm. for the opportunity uh, to be on this platform. I am so grateful and God bless you. 
Thank you. And God bless you too. Behind every good woman is a strong man. <laughs> So we thank you again. Uh, thank you to our listeners, all the law enforcement officers out there. Uh, we are going to be posting this recording on YouTube so that you can listen in on it again. And I will I will ensure that um, our commission of police in Trinidad and Tobago gets your message and um, your thanks and your gratitude to her and your commendations to her. And um, Dr. Green, on this note, we say thank you and we say goodbye to all our listeners. Have a wonderful weekend. Heart Talk Between Sisters Radio Broadcast. Tune in to a heartwarming and enlightening radio experience like no other. Join us on a journey of love, laughter, and lifelong connections as we explore the unique bond between sisters. Our broadcast is a celebration of sisterhood, offering a safe space for candid conversations, shared memories, and inspiring stories that touch the soul. Whether you're a sister yourself or simply appreciate the beauty of this extraordinary relationship, this broadcast is for you. Discover the secrets of sisterly love, support, and understanding as we delve into personal experiences and heart-to-heart -heart conversations that will make you smile, cry, and reflect. So, grab your favorite cup of tea, get cozy, and let our heart talk between sisters, broadcast warm your heart and lift your spirits. Join us every week for an emotional journey filled with wisdom, connection, and the enduring power of sisterly bonds. Don't miss out on this extraordinary experience. To listen to our station WCAN radio for this and other informative programs all day long, visit www.wcanradio.us. To be a special guest in any of our segments or to support us financially through sponsorship, call 1-868-397-5961 six seven eight eight five six three seven oh nine We certainly want to thank our host, Alana Wheeler, and our special guest, Chief Superintendent, Sarah Afari, for joining us here on this program. It was an amazing program. We also would like to thank our listeners listening all over the world, uh, those in Ghana, the police officers who support uh, Chief Superintendent and who's under her command. We, we want to appreciate you and thank you for uh, listening in. And uh, we want you to know that, uh, uh, let us know what you think about the broadcast. Uh, continue to share the link of Heart Talk Between Sisters. We are looking for sisters all over the world to interview. It doesn't have to be police officers, but people all over the world. And um, uh, to bring to the forefront uh, some of the challenges that women go through, the success and in the success in getting there, the, the the challenges they face sometimes in a man's world as we experienced this morning, but with determination and God and faith and and study and everything else, uh, they rise to the top. And this is what Hard Talk Between Sisters is all about, the Your Story segment. You heard the professionalism comes out. There's so many different levels 
uh, within the conversation. You heard the struggle. You heard the determination. You heard her faith in God. And it just gives the opportunity for you who are listening out there as a woman, maybe even as a man, that whatever you set your mind out to do, you can accomplish it with God. It doesn't matter what the challenges are. And your story, as in this case with Chief Superintendent uh, Sarah Abafari, her story has become our story. It's become your story because we personalize them and they become your story because somewhere in your struggle, somewhere in, in the way your life has been uh, going, you can find, you know, comparisons, you can find compatibilities with uh, her story. It may not be the exact same thing, whether it's in education or family life or studies or career, you can find similarities in the stories that will give you strength and courage to continue your journey. And this is what we're about. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, the station is a 24-hour station, so we continue here in the studio uh, broadcasting. And uh, after such a great thing, we will cool you down with some good, relaxing music.